back, would you take your copy of Scripture and turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we'll be reading verses 24 through 32. Okay, verse 24 of chapter 1 of Romans. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Let's pray together. Now, Father, as we open your word to this important text, Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear, help us to have minds that would focus with a view to obedience. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as you're being seated, let me just uh, commend you. Our Great Commission offering total thus far, $8,962. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your generosity. I'm an encouraged by that. I was just, as I said earlier, praying this morning, thinking if we had $10,000, uh, that would be a, a great uh, praise to God for his faithfulness. And... Uh, I know that some of you may not have been able to give this morning, and certainly you're welcome, as I said. And uh, we'll come to you in the future and talk with you about some of the places that we can send this money to uh, continue to uh, have the gospel preached in places we can't go. And I am, I believe, in the history of the church, um, that's probably the biggest um, one-day mission offering that we've ever received this morning. So praise the Lord for his faithfulness. Thank you. Well, we are about to uh, enter into a text here that um, we need to make sure that we give careful attention to. It's a text in which, as you probably know from past, and then if not just from our reading just a moment ago, uh, that we're going to be talking about, at least in part, homosexuality. And so we need to talk about that biblically, and we need to think about what God would say to us and we need to think about how that God is using, through the Apostle Paul, homosexuality as um, really the um, object lesson, the, the, the thing that is m most evident of the disordered thinking that happens when men are given over to themselves. And so we'll talk more about that, but we want to work our way through the passage. And so to set that up, just remember that what we have previously seen and understood from this first chapter is that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. That is the righteousness from God. The righteousness that is required for all people is revealed in the gospel. And so the gospel is powerful to bring to salvation all who would believe, and Paul feels under compulsion, obligation, if you will, to go and preach this gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation because it does reveal the righteousness from God that is necessary for all those who believe. And so now we begin here as we did last Sunday morning seeing that God's wrath is being revealed. Why do we need that righteousness? Because God's wrath is being revealed. Just as the gospel reveals the righteousness that is necessary to come into his presence, so now God's wrath is being revealed on all those who would reject 
and those who would continue in sin. And we see in verse 18 that this, this wrath is revealed now, currently, not in some future cataclysmic event, though that is true to some degree, but what Paul is emphasizing in these verses is that that wrath is being poured out currently right now. Since the fall of Adam and Eve to this very moment, the wrath of God is being poured out from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men. And the reason for that, the explanation that is given, the justification for that wrath is given in verses 19 through 23 that we looked at carefully last Sunday morning, and that is because what is known about God is plain to them because God himself has shown it to them and his invisible, invincible attributes, his eternal power, that is his greatness and his goodness, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived so that men are without excuse. So in, in part, what Paul is writing about here is those people who would say, well, I didn't know. Nobody told me. Yes, God himself told you. He told you clearly, plainly, that you could know him, and you are totally without excuse. That is, every man, every person has been without excuse since the fall. For although they knew God, verse 21, they did not honor him, they did not worship him, nor did they give thanks to him, and they became futile in their thinking, and their hearts became dark. Though they claimed to be wise and know all the things that would be about God, they were religious perhaps, even more than that, they just claimed to be wise in their own self-sufficiency, their own self-efforts. They really were fools, and they exchanged the glory of God for images that is idols that resembled mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So they exchanged the most glorious for the least valuable. They abandoned God is basically what's happened here. They abandoned him. Now, they willfully did it. They, they chose to do it. They were glad to do it. But they abandoned him, and they now they are without excuse. And because they have abandoned God, now we're going to see the execution of God's wrath is that he is going to abandon them. We see it there really three different times in verse 24. Notice with me. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity. We'll come back to these checks in just a moment. Notice verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Notice verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. That is, th this is not a passive judgment. This is an active judicial judgment. This is an active judicial judgment on those who abandoned God, so now God is abandoning them. They find themselves in a downward spiral that confirms their condemnation, that confirms the judgment that they so deserve. And this is the state of man. This is the universality of sin. This is the reality of all people without excuse. And they cannot trust in their own self-effort, their own self-righteousness, their self-sufficiency, their religion, their catechisms, their baptisms, their church attendance. They can trust in nothing but Christ alone to redeem them from this being given over. That's the truth of the gospel. That's the power of the gospel. And so I want you to think with me that there are some things here that need to be carefully thought about. And we need to make sure that we're clear. We need to be 
sensitive. I know within this room right now, some of you have loved ones who are in the lifestyle, in the homosexual lifestyle. Some of you know people, friends, perhaps co-workers, people in your family. This is not to condemn any one person. Uh, we certainly want to be hopeful because the gospel is hopeful. We want to be loving because that's how we would understand that we should react to these that would find themselves in that lifestyle. So I'm not trying to bring any condemnation on a particular person, but I am trying to help us to understand the text and what the text says. And what the text says is that homosexuality is a result of God's judgment. It's not freedom. It's not that somehow that they have found themselves in a sexual revolution and now they have freedom to do what they want. And they've thrown off the restraints of God and his acquainted ways and these Old Testament rules. Somehow now they are free to express themselves through their sexuality. It's not that at all. What they have been given over to is the judgment of God. And it's not just homosexuality. You read the list with me, did you not? Beginning there in verse 29. Malice, gossip, slanders, haters, insolent. All that list that is not exhaustive nor comprehensive, but certainly a list to be reckoned with and to be thought about, and we'll address it as we get to it. So God gives them up. He says it three times. They abandoned God, so God will abandon them. And the thing that we want to know and, and try to bring out of the passage is why does God give these people up? Why does he do it? And then how does he do it? And so basically there's a couple of points though there that uh, are not original with me. They come from Tom Askell, pastor in Oklahoma. But we want to consider those two points, and I think that they would help us to, to give some hooks to hang on to from the text. So notice that God gave them up because of verse 23, first of all, because they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So God gave them up. This is the why. Why does God give people up? Because they willfully, deliberately, gladly exchange the glory of the immortal God for images that they create from their own hands, out of their own imagination, or that they see in nature. Not only that, but verse <coughs> 25 gives us a second reason that God gives these up, and it's because they exchange the truth about God for a lie. Not only did they exchange the glory of God for images, but they exchanged the truth about God for lies. And their lies became truth to them. Their lies were the false teaching, the, the teaching of their own imagination, their own heart. They, they took what God had revealed about himself, because remember, he, he revealed it plainly and clearly. They took that, and they twisted it, and they perverted it, and they made God to be something that he's not, and they created God in their own image and what they desired him to be. They traded the truth. They exchanged the glory of God. They exchanged the truth of God. And then we see down in verse 28 another reason for the why did God give them up? Because they did not see fit to acknowledge God. They did not see fit to acknowledge him. We just read just a moment ago there in verse 21 that, that they did not honor him. They did not worship him. They did not give him thanks, which is the proper response of the creature to the creator 
the, it's the proper response of the one who has seen in all that God has made that there is something, someone who has done this, that someone is powerful, and that someone is not me. The proper response then is worship, honor, thanksgiving. But no, they did not acknowledge God. They did not see fit. They did not see their way to do that. And so all of these things that we see as reasons, all that I have given you, they exchanged the glory of God, they exchanged the truth of God, they did not see fit to acknowledge God. All of these things then become reasons why God would give them over to themselves. They chose it. This is what they wanted. And so God sends his wrath upon them in the form of continuing destroying sin. H have you noticed in the scripture, and, and again, this is not an original thought with me. It was a great theologian who said this, but sin is the punishment of sin. So they go from bad to worse. And we're going to see the pattern in just a moment is how God brings the wrath upon mankind because this is what they deserve. They exchange the glory of God. They exchange the truth of God, and they would not acknowledge him. But then there are three ways that we can see that are how God gives them up. Three ways from the verses. Verse 24, therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. See, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts. That is this burning passion, this desire for sexual immorality. Because when men and women turn away from God and they begin to exchange the glory of God and the truth of God and they won't acknowledge God, what they turn to is sexual immorality, sexual sin. And they find it within themselves the greatest way to worship themselves would be sexual sin. And so this is a giving up of the natural lust that men would have for women and women would have for men. This is the natural lust of their hearts to sexual immorality. It's impurity. And so this is God's judicial judgment. If you want sexual immorality and you want all the consequences that come with that, and if you want the remorse and the guilt and the shame and the perversion and the disease that come with that, you may have it. God gave them up. God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to the dishonoring of their bodies. And this is what happens in a culture, in a nation that continues to celebrate, promote, honor sexual immorality of every type. This is what happens. God gives that society, that nation over. We see all kinds of dishonoring, vile, evil things that come across our television, in magazines, radio, newspaper, wherever it is. Sex sells everything, doesn't it? And we're not talking about a good, healthy, biblical sexuality. We're talking about a perverted, twisted, given over to the lusts of your own heart. Verse 25 says, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. So we know that they've exchanged not only the glory of God, but they've exchanged the truth of God. And, and notice what they do when they make this exchange. They worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. They worship. 
and serve the creature. Does this not sound familiar? Is this not the day in which we live? But this has always been the case. We just have it at our fingertips. We carry it around in our pockets. It's everywhere. And we give time, intention, treasure, thought, talent to sexual perversion. We're swimming in it. We get caught up in it. Pornography is rampant, even in the church. Men and women. There's a rise in women being addicted to pornography. Because we have become futile in our thinking and our hearts are darkened. We are under the wrath of God. There's no freedom in this. There's no joy in this. No matter what the culture says, no matter how they try to push this agenda of sexual freedom, reproductive freedom, you know, when they came out with birth control, it ruined, it ruined the biblical understanding of proper sexual relationship because now sex can be anybody, anytime, anywhere, and you don't have the consequences of procreation. Birth control. This was in the 70s. And then you add to that abortion. And then you add to that the wrath of God, unbridled lust, given over to ourselves, no consequences, anytime, anybody, anywhere, anything goes. And we wonder why the society is falling apart all around us. The wrath of God is on us. We worship it. We serve the creature rather than the creator. And Paul has to put this little comment in here, this blessing, that no matter what men do, no matter how perverted, how given over to their lust they are, God is blessed forever. He is true and right and just and faithful. Amen. Then we see not only that God would give them over in his wrath to the lust of their hearts, but notice there in verse 26, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. That is, this is a natural passion. First, he gives you up to natural passion, where what you think about continually is sex and this perversion and how you can have your flesh fulfilled. But then he says next that he would give them up to unnatural, or as the text says, dishonorable passions, which are described for us there beginning in the next sentence. For their women exchange natural relationships or natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. It's not natural for women to be sexually engaged with other women. It's not natural for men to be sexually engaged with other men. It's unnatural. It's dishonorable. It's shameful. It's perverted. It's contrary to nature. The men gave themselves up, and they were, look at verse 27, consumed with passion. They were burning up with passion. They, they couldn't find rest until their flesh was satisfied in the passion of unnatural relationship. They committed shameless acts. No regret, no remorse, open celebrated, promoted. What was it in 2015 the Supreme Court um, legalized same-sex marriage? That's the wrath of God. That's not good news to celebrate. That's God's wrath. Because now we have people 
who would be in unnatural relationships. It's not a marriage. You can't define marriage as a male marrying a male. You can't define marriage as a female marrying a female. You can't define it that way because the Bible has defined it for us. And this is God's wrath. And notice that it has its penalty. These men and these women who commit these shameless acts find in themselves the due penalty for their error. In, in other words, you cannot exchange the glory of God, the truth of God, and not acknowledge God and not have the consequences for doing that. It will come every time. This is why we're warned over and over again that your sin will find you out. You can't hide it. We have in our culture now this um, LBGTQ plus and is promoted, celebrated. Think about um, the fact that those who involve themselves in that kind of lifestyle, male or female, are four times more likely to commit suicide than the natural than the uh, national average. Four times more likely to do that. Between thirteen and twenty-four, we're talking about between thirteen and twenty-four. Five, over, over 4 million Americans put themselves in that category. One of those acronyms or one of those initials, transgender, homosexual, lesbian, put themselves in that place. And they commit suicide at a f much faster rate. You know what we've done? W we've said... We said, God, you cannot tell us how we are created. We will identify the way that we want to be, crea be, be created. We will identify the way that we see fit. We've exchanged the glory of God and the truth of God, and we've not acknowledged him. In fact, we've shaken our fist at him and said, we will determine. I will determine who I am, and you can't tell me otherwise. That's the wrath of God when we get to that place. That's disordered thinking. That's unnatural. And the greatest example of that is when I can look at the creature who is just like me and look at him in the face and desire him in an unnatural way because it fulfills the idolatry in my heart. That's what we're talking about here. Every sin is idolatry. But Paul uses homosexuality as the picture that is most prevalent through homosexuality. Because you see one who is just like you. Just exactly like you. Gender, sex, and and you say, that's what I want. And you take that one. And you worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. Now, I know these are hard things. I know you have friends and people that you love. And keep loving them. Keep loving them. Pray for them. Let's hold out the hope of the gospel. Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, there in chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, and he talks about, such were some of you. And homosexuality is included in that listing. Such were some of you. The power of the gospel can change. A person who is sexually immoral, immoral in the natural sense or a person who is sexually immoral 
immoral, in an unnatural sense. The power of the gospel can change those people. He changed us. Amen? Well, it's a difficult thing. Remember in um, 2019, I believe it was, when the state of New York um, passed through their Senate, their state Senate, the law um, establishing reproductive health law, I believe it was called, uh, where basically you can do abortion at any time. Up to that point, it was only um, up to the first and second trimester, and um, there were some restrictions, some regulations around it. Um, but but they, um, Governor Cuomo, Cuomo was the one who signed that bill into law. You remember that? And it was on television, and you could watch it on Fox News. And like, they all stood, and they... And they cheered and yelled, didn't they? They don't know that they're under the wrath of God. What they've done. And many following. We live in a culture, listen, you as believers, this is why it's so important that you live a life consistent with the Bible, that you are unashamed of the gospel. You live in a culture that is under the wrath of God. And it's not going to change. You've got to go and be faithful to preach the gospel, to share the gospel, one heart at a time, one life at a time. It's not going to change by political maneuvering. That's what I should say. It's not going to be changed by any kind of legislation or any of those things. It's only going to change because we get a burden for those who are under the wrath of God and are willing to do what's necessary. Share with them gently, to love them. Not in any way, not in any way giving any kind of um, recognition, applause, agreement with their sin. Whether it be sexual immorality in the natural way or whether it be homosexuality, Finally, God has given them over to their passions, natural passions. God has given them over to their unnatural passions. And look there in verse 28. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. So the wrath of God gives over to a debased mind. We don't think rationally or rightly. The Bible is nothing. It has no authority. It has no sufficiency. I was doing a funeral yesterday for a gentleman, some of you may know, uh, Terry Don Speed. But I didn't know him personally, but I knew some of the family, and so One of the things that I have to say at funerals now is this is God's word to you. And it is sufficient, and it is authoritative, and it has a right to declare what is true, and you must heed to it. Because they don't. They don't. And so they are given over, we, I keep using the the word they, but we, people, are given over to a debased mind. That's why we have all these strange things happening in our culture where men and women can go in the opposite sex restroom and why you can have men who are changing their gender to compete in women's sports and How does any of that make sense? That's what happens when you get a debased mind. 
It can't be rational. can't be logical. certainly can't be biblical. But then this debased mind gives itself over in all manner of unrighteousness. Evil, covetousness, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. Disobedient to parents. Wow, that's something to think about, isn't it? Students. Disobedient to parents is in this list. Something to think about. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. It's not just homosexuality. It's not just sexual immorality. But it's all these things. Unless you and I think that somehow, well, that's not me. Use these things as Tom Askell challenged his congregation and I was able to overhear. Use these things to measure the last movie that you watched, the last book that you read, the music that you listened to, the people that you hang with. Use these things beca to become the measure for yourself. Well, finally, verse 32, they know God's righteous decree. Why do they know it? Because remember, God revealed it to them. It was plain. It was evident. They are without excuse. Th they know that those who practice these things, any unrepentant sin, not just homosexuality, it is sin that sends you to hell. It's not homosexuality in and of itself. It's not sexual immorality. It's sin that sends you to hell. And God's righteous decree tells us what's right or wrong. We know this, and yet we suppress it. Verse 18, we suppress it. We try to push it down. We push it away. We don't want anything to do with it. We push it away from us and back. We don't want it. And we know we deserve to die for these things. Not only do we practice these things, but we give approval to those who do it. And so we pass laws in our culture, in our nation, that allows these kinds of things to go on and with no consequences. And so, yes, there is hope, though. There is hope. Because the gospel, as I said earlier, can change you. Would you repent and would you believe? Any person who finds themselves in a homosexual lifestyle or a, or a natural perversion of sexual immorality, any person who finds themselves as a murderer or a gossip or covetous or a hater of God or an inventor of evil, a full of malice and guile, any person who finds themselves there can repent, turn from that sin, and believe in Christ and be saved from your sin. So would you be saved? Would you be saved? Yes, our sin is great, but our Savior is greater. Amen? So repent, come to saving faith. Well, God help us as we think about this. I know it's been heavy this morning. It's been long. Thank you for your patience. But I hope what we see from here, and much more probably could have been said and perhaps even should have been said, but I hope what we can take from this is um, the fact that the Bible tells us the truth. The culture tells us a lie. At least that's part of what we need to take from here. So it's not acceptable. not acceptable but let's help them let's pray father thank you that we're able to come to your word and get truth uh, thank you that you have um, revealed that to us 
And Lord, help us not to kick back. Help us not to rebel against you. Father, our flesh would cry out in some ways that to say this is unfair or it's not right. And they're not really talking about homosexual relationships here. It's talking about other perverted, perverted kinds of sexual immorality. But no, it's the truth. So, Father, thank you for rescuing us. Thank you for delivering us. And, Father, may we be instruments to help deliver others. Father, may we not be ashamed. May we go forth in boldness knowing the power of the gospel can change lives. Father, help us to be loving and gracious, but in no way excusing. Father, give us strength for these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.